Good afternoon, everyone. I call to order the uh, Higher Education Finance and Policy Committee for Tuesday, March 5th at 1.09 p.m. Uh, first up today, we have Senate File 1702. Uh, Senator Claussen, would you like to move your bill? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I'll just wait a, a moment until my testifiers come up, and then I'd like to introduce uh, an amendment before we do that, if I could. Okay. Thank you, Senator Claussen. Uh, what amendment do you have? Well, Chair uh, Drayheim and committee members, thank you for the opportunity to present uh, Senate File 1702. It's a proposal to provide mental health training for University of Minnesota pediatric residents in outpatient child psychiatric care clinics. And Mr. Chair, I would like to offer the A1 amendment, I'd like to, to move the A1 amendment. Senator Claussen moves uh, to amend Senate File 1702 with the A1 amendment. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Just a little bit about the amendment. It identifies an appropriation for the bill, uh, reporting requirements, and adds enhanced language on line 11 that was offered by Senator Jensen as uh, we met with him. So I um, appreciate those comments. Well, you have a handout uh, that illustrates Minnesota's mental health crisis. And uh, it's a colored map, University of the uh, State of Minnesota. Uh, these maps are provided by the federal government. They do studies to identify uh, needs across the state. In this particular case, you'll note that this is for mental health. And as you look across the state of Minnesota, you'll find there are only two regions in Minnesota that are federally designated as having adequate mental health services. The metro area is one of those two areas, and the other is the south uh, eastern counties of Minnesota that are served by the Mayo Clinic. So it's obvious that we need to expand the mental health services here in the state of Minnesota, and I think we've heard that message over the last few years. Senate File 1702 will provide mental health training for pediatric residents to meet this challenge that we're facing. The first point of contact for children with behavioral health problems is the primary care provider. Unfortunately, under current pediatric training, there is very little training in behavioral health to properly and appropriately care for the increasing number of children requiring behavioral health care. Senate File 1702 provides mental health training for University of Minnesota pediatric residents currently that is not being provided. A little bit of history, too, on this. Back in 2013, the legislature took action to address mental health issues in Minnesota by providing funding for a mental health summit. And the summit was held in May of 2014, and there were over 200 attendees, professionals and members of the public attended. And the summit resulted in 24 recommendations, 15 of those centered on education and training, including increasing exposure to psychiatric mental health experiences for medical school students and increased continuing education offerings for physicians. A recommendation to increase exposure to psychiatric mental health experience for primary care physicians was also made in the Healthcare Workforce Commission report in 2016. Turning attention again to your packet of information, there are some letters of support from the American Academy of Pediatrics, Minnesota Psychiatric Society, uh, Sue Abderholden, uh, who is the executive director of NAMI here in Minnesota. She has written a letter of support. And you also have a handout uh, that's uh, kind of an overview of Senate File 1702 there's some background information, statistics on mental illness. There's some warning signs and what parents can do uh, when faced with a child mental health concern. We have three testifiers today, uh, Mr. Chair and committee, and I will uh, just allow them to introduce themselves and we'll proceed with a testimony. Would you like to begin? Sure. Thank you very much, uh, committee members and Mr. Chairman. I'm Emily Borman Chope. I am a general pediatrician. I'm the vice chair of education in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Minnesota and the director of the pediatric residency program. We are really delighted to be here today to partner with you and explore how we can take better care of kids and their families in Minnesota. 
So I'll um, just hit some high points of the background information that you have. I want to share a little bit about our residency training program at the University of Minnesota and then um, give you an a overview of what we're hoping to achieve. So as you can see from the handouts and as Senator Claussen highlighted, one in five kids in Minnesota have a chronic mental health condition, such as, such as ADHD, depression, or anxiety. But a recent 2017 study showed that 45% of those kids aren't getting any kind of care from a mental health professional. And many of our young people are struggling significantly. In 2016, 12% of teens in Minnesota said they had seriously considered suicide in the past year. So we know the need is great, and as Senator Claussen pointed out, primary care providers are really that front line for getting kids the help they need. Over 70% of the pediatricians who are currently practicing in the state of Minnesota complete their residency training at the University of Minnesota program. As a proud graduate of our program, I can tell you that we have a strong, vibrant program with an incredible depth of training. But as with many programs across the country, we don't currently have enough dedicated hands-on opportunities for trainees to build their skills, particularly in outpatient mental health care, diagnosing, recognizing, and beginning initial treatment. That long-term relationship that we have in kids and our families really provides an incredible foundation in which to start families getting the care that they need. And right now, there's just too many missed opportunities. So this um, journey for us, with quite a few trips to the Capitol, started in 2017 when the American Academy of Pediatrics and the American Board of Pediatrics really put out a call, of action, a call to action across the country, saying that we have to change the way that we train pediatricians so that we can take better care of kids. We are really fortunate to partner with Senator Claussen, who's been a real champion and patient teacher for us in the legislative process, and we've built a kind of grassroots group with expertise across the spectrum of child mental health care. We have general pediatricians, developmental behavioral pediatricians, adolescent medicine doctors, child psychiatrists, um, child psychologists. You'll hear from a couple of my colleagues um, in a minute. So really what we're trying to do is to create authentic experiences for trainees to get hands-on opportunities to take care of kids with common behavioral and mental health problems in the outpatient setting that mirrors what they'll do when they go out into practice. Right now, too many pediatricians don't feel comfortable starting medications, refer too late, and they don't get kids the care that they need. So this initiative will help us to partner with experts in mental health and really give pediatricians that confidence that when they go out into independent practice, they can meet kids and families where they are and start treatment and diagnosis sooner. The scope of this initial project is focusing on pediatric residents, but we think it really has potential to show a roadmap for what we could do in family medicine for our nurse practitioner colleagues and really do work across the medical school. We uh, are delighted to answer any questions that you have, and I'll just pass it on to my colleagues to share a little bit more of their experience and their uh, role in this group. Thank you. And uh, whoever's next, if you want to identify yourself for the for the team. Hi, my name is Dr. Katie Lingress, and I'm a child psychologist at the University of Minnesota in the Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences Department. A lot of my work is based in the community, and I work primarily with children 0 to 12, and I also work a lot with the providers of these children. So much of my work here in Minnesota and also in other states has been focused on really building the skills of those providers and non-mental health practitioners, such as teachers and medical providers. And the hope is that we can really help them to identify and address children's mental health issues that they observe or that come to their attention. So I'm currently working on a project that is grant funded with a family medicine clinic that uses a very similar program to what this bill proposes. So today I'd like to share a story to illustrate some of this work and the value of the proposed bill for children and families. Last week a faculty member who was discussing a case with a resident and brought me into the conversation. The initial concerns raised were about an 11 year old patient who was experiencing concerns related to attention and learning at school. The resident faculty attending and I discussed how we could help parents advocate for an evaluation through the school for these concerns. However, in passing, the resident mentioned that the parents had also shared that the girl had inconsistent contact with her mother due to child protection concerns. Immediately, I thought we needed to dig a little bit deeper to figure out what might be going on underneath those attention and learning concerns. I asked the resident to share a little bit more about the patient's history. At that point, she realized that the father and her, his partner had not yet provided much information about this. 
So the resident and I made a plan for how she could return to the visit and gather some more information. After a few minutes, she returned to and requested to speak with me again. During that time, the resident had learned that there'd been a history of abuse and possible neglect that led to the removal of both children from her mother, their mother's care. The children were now living with dad and his partner and had recently begun weekend visits with mom. As we learned more about the possible trauma history that this girl and her brother had experienced, the resident's eyes began to widen. She nodded her agreement, but clearly was hesitant. As we wrapped up our discussion and my coaching for her conversation with the parents, she said, would you be able to come in with me? We proceeded to have a conversation with the parents that, st that started with a lot of uncertainty about the idea of therapy. As we talked, the family was able to see the value of the therapy and began to express some understanding of the potential impact of that early history of trauma. We scheduled a follow-up visit with the intention to further assess some concerns related to mood and anxiety and to identify therapy resources in the community that would be a good fit with the family's schedule and needs. After we left the room, I had a chance to speak further with the resident. She shared insights that she had gained in terms of how to speak with the family about complex and potentially sensitive issues such as trauma, and she expressed ex appreciation about being prompted to ask these questions in the first place. She noted that she likely would have missed this deeper need if not for our conversation. This family benefited directly from the opportunity that this resident had to receive on-the-job training in children's mental health, and I believe that this resident now will view future conversations in which ADHD or learning concerns are raised from a new perspective. All residents deserve learning opportunities for identifying and discussing children's mental health concerns, such as in this example. And all families deserve to benefit from providers who've received solid training about children's mental health. The return on this type of investment would be seen for years to come for both families in the community and for the next generation of providers that we are training. This proposed bill would allow us to begin a new program for the pediatric residents to formalize this type of training and ultimately start to address that shortage of mental health providers that exists across the state. We hope that when an 11-year-old with an undiagnosed trauma history or other mental health needs goes to her pediatrician, the family would leave with appropriate identification of needs and feeling like all of their questions had been answered by the first provider that they approach, and that each provider approached will feel comfortable and confident to meet these needs. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Amanda Schlesinger. Um, I am a child and adolescent psychiatrist in the University of Minnesota Department of Psychiatry. Um, and Dr. Lingris just gave a great uh, example of what it'd be like to do more of this on-the-job training. And what I want to tell you a little bit about is what it's like to be a psychiatrist, seeing the tremendous need that's coming in from primary care providers and pediatricians on the front line. And what we know is that pediatricians and family physicians are the ones who usually see these health problems first because patients trust them. And then when they're there for their routine checkups is when this stuff starts to pop up and suddenly they start hearing that something's not going well at school or that their child seems sad. And by the time they get to me, they're usually really ill already. And so the pediatricians are the ones who have that first chance to start intervening and solving the problem before it's really severe, before the child isn't doing well in school, and before they're coming to see me. Um, and so I tend to see a lot of referrals coming in from pediatricians. And so I want to tell you a recent ideal scenario of when this is working really well. I recently saw a child in an outpatient clinic with severely worsened anxiety. Um, she was in real distress. Her parents took her to her pediatrician first. She started her on an anti-anxiety medication, but they still wanted her to come and see psychiatry. So when I saw her, she was already feeling a little better and, and doing a lot better. Um, and then I was able to make the specific psychiatric diagnosis. Um, and then I was able to add on another specialized medication. And now she's, she's really feeling better. And this is how pediatrics and psychiatry can work together best, but the pediatricians need that on-the-job training to feel confident to start those medications, because the last thing they want to do is cause harm to a kid with a medication they don't feel comfortable using. And the way MDs learn is by seeing cases and having supervising doctors that really know what they're doing tell them, hey, you could go this direction, here's some tips, let's talk to the patient together, and that's how we learn 
best. And so this bill will provide that on the job support so that these doctors can go out into the communities and feel confident for the rest of their career treating these mental health problems right away as they're popping up. And I've been really fortunate to work with a great variety of pediatricians and pediatric residents through my training. And what I see is that their level of comfort now is extremely variable. Because when referrals come in to me, sometimes they've done a great job trialing medications. And sometimes the referral is, I have no idea what to do. And sometimes co cases are complicated and it needs to go to a psychiatrist immediately. But our wait times are terribly long. And so we want kids to not have any delay getting started on care as quickly as they can. And there are so many common conditions that can get started with a confident, well-trained pediatrician. So this is a great way to work on our mental health care shortage and wait time crisis. And um, thank you so much for having us here. We're really excited about this project. Senator Cohen. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so, Mr. Chairman, Doctor, when you talk about the administration of medication from a pediatrician, so is that, uh, w what's the dividing line? I mean, the pediatrician is not going to prescribe neuroleptic medication, I assume, to a child. Uh, I assume that would be a, a bridge too far. Uh, Typically, pediatricians don't feel comfortable prescribing neuroleptics, atypical antipsychotics, that type of medication. But most pediatricians will provide ADHD medications, um, first-line antidepressants and anti-anxiety medications, ones that um, don't require intensive monitoring. Um, and Dr. Bormanchuk can speak to you know, what the scope of practice is typically. Well, I think it really varies, and it depends on what you've had experience with and who you have access to. I mean, I can certainly see from my work with this group and having ready access to experts that my scope of practice has appropriately expanded, and I think that's what we see in clinics where they have integrated mental health with a psychiatrist right alongside them, that there may be pediatricians who can appropriately expand and even use some of the medications that are a little more complex with good support behind the scenes. So, Mr. Chairman. Senator Cohen. So, Mr. Chairman, so I'm assuming then that at least relative to psychiatrists, not versus pediatrician, but uh, there's a comfort between the, the uh, uh, two specialties as to how far, if I can use the phrase, a pediatrician might go uh, versus at what point you a pediatrician kind of crosses a line into more of the psychiatric practice. I, my experience of pediatricians and being one myself is that we're, I would say, probably the most cautious of medical providers. So we really tend to be um, uh, very much not wanting to use a medication unless we really feel confident that what we're doing is the right thing for a child and we want to feel really sure. And medication is a part of it, but I think the other thing that we really see is that pediatricians may not engage our psychology colleagues nearly as soon as we should. And so having that conversation and saying, gosh, you know, I think your child could really benefit from working with a therapist for a period of time. There's a lot of good work that can be done here. So it's not just medical treatment, but it's therapy treatment, and it's bringing in appropriate treatment at the right time. Because I think what we see is a lot of delays, where we see a child at a well child check at age four, and they seem quite anxious. But we say, oh, maybe that's just a phase. And then they're five, and then they're six, and they're still having the same issues. And so we want to really kind of make sure that pediatricians work in concert with our mental health colleagues to give kids the treatment they need when they need it and to do what's appropriate for their scope of practice. Senator Cohen. Fine, thank you. Okay. Members, any additional comments or questions? Senator Jensen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, thank you, Senator um, Cawson, for bringing this uh, bill to us. I think one of the uh, major benefits that may not be right on the surface is uh, the relationship building that will go on between uh, pediatricians and the mental health community. And I just don't think that can be stressed enough. I think that we've fortunately seen a bit of an awakening whereby there's true value in connecting medical care to mental health care and not isolating them and taking care of them in silos. 
So I think that what you're doing here could end up being a springboard for what other residency programs would do as well. So thank you. Is any uh, additional comments or questions for Senator Claussen or the testifiers? Seeing none, Senator Claussen, any final comments? Mr. Chair, thank you for the opportunity uh, to be before you today. And uh, this is this is really a crisis in our state. You know, mental health uh, for young people is increasing issues that we're being confronted with. And the first line of defense are the pediatric uh, doctors that we have that uh, have access to, to uh, specialized training. And if we can give them more tools to be successful, I think that's an extremely important. Senator Claussen. Uh, so that member, Senate File 1702, uh, recommended to pass as amended and referred to HHS. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. Uh, you're on your way to HHS. Senator Claussen, thank you. Thank, thank you, you for being much. here. Thank you. Next up, we have Senate File 1473, Senator Dreheim. Senator Dreheim, like to move your bill? I would. I would like to move Senate File 1473. So moved. <clears throat> Chair, I, I hope we have time for this lengthy bill. Yeah. <laughs> we do, Senator Dreheim. Please proceed. Thank you. Um, so the, the two years we've been here, or I've been here, uh, we, we've had a lot of discussion about affordability. And um, this is another attempt at uh, trying to reduce the uh, cost for college um, for people taking online courses. So it, it's pretty straightforward. It just says that online courses shouldn't cost more than on-campus courses. But I, but I do have a couple testifiers here, Chair. Um, I'd like to turn it over to them. Great. Uh, first up we have on the agenda is uh, Josh Hansen. Josh, if you just uh, repeat your name for the tape and proceed whenever you're ready. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, for the record, my name is Josh Hansen, and uh, I'd like to begin by thanking you all for the opportunity to give my testimony today. Um, I'm a proud resident who uh, resides in the Snow Warrior part of greater Minnesota. I currently attend Minnesota State Community and Technical College in Moorhead where I also have the honor of serving as the student body president. I'm here today to testify in support of Senate File 1473. I would like to share with you all today my experiences and what I have heard from other students when it comes to the difference in cost of online courses and in-class courses in our colleges. As a first-generation college student and what some might deem as a non-traditional student due to my coming back to school after 10 years off, the finance, or the financial barriers that come with college education are wrongly just as daunting as the classes that we have to take. It is no secret that the citizens of our great state who seek to better themselves carry with them a burden that has a dollar sign on it. This is on top of having bills, obligations, and a distinct lack of time. Time is really the factor here. Online courses allow for quality education while fitting into a busy schedule that is necessary to put food on the table. Myself, without the option to be flexible with coursework, could have never done as much with my schooling. However, I'm told because of resources utilized, whether I'm in or out of class, I must choose to pay more to go to class online than to sit in the classroom. I find this to be extremely concerning. I'm not the only one who shares this belief. While I incur more debt from these costs, some students that I represent have come forward and stated that they pay out of pocket. Paying anything extra out of pocket for a student means that these students will have to work more hours at their jobs, giving them less time for homework or to be in the classroom. Many of these students who are taking online courses are non-traditional students, hardworking mothers and fathers, or students who live in greater Minnesota like myself where travel distances may be an issue. Uh, that the need of the benefit of flexibility that online education provides so that they can complete their degrees while managing other aspects of their lives and careers. 
The cost may have been justifiable when I was a kid, when computer infrastructure was becoming a major part of our education system as a whole. But now even in-person classes require the same utilization of online D2L and like systems for homework, quizzes, and sometimes even tests. Lectures can be posted online, notes can be posted, discussions can happen beyond the classroom. I have seen firsthand that there is generally nothing that is done in an online class that is not mirrored on the same online systems that are used by instructors in the classroom. Pre-recorded lectures can be used a fair amount of time and updated at the discretion of the instructor. This does not take the amount of time that it would need to take to justify the much higher cost of tuition for online courses. The benefits of online courses are being outweighed by the cost associated with taking them. The current system is essentially punishing students for needing the flexibility that is easily provided with the current state of technology. Students can go to YouTube and receive instruction and lecture for no cost because someone from another university took it upon themselves to post lessons for students across our country. The ease at which information is accessed has advanced while the pricing in our colleges has not. There is no logic but greed in these prices, and the messages that it is sending our students is that you have children, that if you have children or a job, then our colleges don't have a place for you. I do not believe that this is true. I do not believe that you all believe that this is true. Educating people like myself and others who work hard in their jobs and their schooling will lead to greater ends of, of, or for our state as a whole. So what I have come to ask to, of you, to testify to you, a course is a course. And we should not punish some for not being able to sit in a classroom on other, someone else's schedule. Higher education is a doorway for every single person. And that doorway should not be locked. It should not be closed. It should not be cracked. It should be shoved wide open so that everyone has an equitable chance at a better life. Thank you all for your time. Mr. Hansen, uh, Mr. Becerra, welcome back to the committee. Just uh, note yourself for the record and proceed whenever you're ready. Thank you for having me back. Uh, for the record, my name is Frankie Becerra, um, but I am uh, reading testimony from Brian Welch, a second year student at Masabi Range College, Virginia campus in Virginia, Minnesota. Uh, his testimony reads, I'm currently enrolled in three online courses due to having my classwork and already having a busy schedule. All three of my classes are offered on land. However, I must take them online because I'm not available at the times that they are normally scheduled at. I'm a very busy student, and an online class is the best way for me to reach my educational goals without straining myself for time. I work on my schedule, and as, I have met the, as long as I have met the deadlines, there isn't anything wrong with that. One question I've always had is, why are my online classes more expensive than the classes that are on campus? I've compared notes, presentations, and assignments. I found little to no difference uh, that justifies such a stark increase in price. I've been told that it's because of the increased technology usage required to run the course, which doesn't make sense to me at all. As students, we pay a significant amount for tuition already and have a technology fee. Why do I have to pay an additional cost on top of that for an online course and the operations around that? Online classes reach students that can't, uh, that can't take online courses. Some might be from greater Minnesota, from, from their, far from their college. Some might be attending from out of state. Some might have difficult with, uh, difficulties with reliable transportation. Some might be non-traditional students who need the flexibility provided by online courses. Others might be too busy, like myself to attend in person. Charging extra for these classes does a disservice to those individuals and puts more roadblocks on the path that has already had enough barriers on their way. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Becerra. Uh, members, any comments or questions? Senator Isaacson. I'm wondering if there's someone from in-state that can answer a question or two. Is there anybody from uh, Mrs. Vice Chancellor King, we could just have a spot for Vice Chancellor King. Welcome back to the committee. Just for the record, please state your name and uh, then I'll turn it over to Senator Isaacson. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Good afternoon. My name is Laura King and I'm the Vice Chancellor and Chief Financial Officer for Minnesota State Colleges and Universities. Thank you. Senator Isaacson. 
So I was looking at a Century in Normandale, and I noticed that Century charges just a little over $3 more a course for online courses, but Normandale charges about $20 more a course. I'm just wondering, uh, I wasn't aware that there was a difference in charges, and I'm wondering if you could walk me through, is it, it clearly is not a universal charge, it must be by, by school. Can you help me understand why there is a difference between online and non-online courses? Chancellor King. Certainly, Mr. Chair and uh, Senator, if I might, I just have some comments to make, and I think they'll answer your question. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, I'd like to convey some concerns that we have about this bill. A very small fraction of our credits are priced through our differential tuition policy, but it's a critical revenue source for our colleges and universities. In 2018, the system offered 3,800 different academic programs. We have online exclusive programs that are offered only online, and we have something we call Online Plus, which is a program that's offered uh, in the classroom with some online features to it. Students may elect, uh, as you heard uh, in the testimony, uh, a variety of different delivery methods. In 2018, we had 559 courses that were considered Online Plus and 134 courses that were considered exclusively online. We've had strong growth in Online Plus and online exclusive courses, yet the differential revenue we receive represents only 4% of our total revenue. We've looked at our online rates and can assure you that all of our offerings are less expensive than the least expensive offering <coughs> elsewhere, whether it's another public system, a private college or university, a nonprofit college or university, a Minnesota-based or a nationally-based provider. Board policy authorizes our campuses to charge a differential rate if, for example, there are extraordinary costs associated with that program. It's accurate to say that all online courses are more costly than those delivered in person. That's important because the differential is based on the course being offered online rather than the discipline or type. Reasons for higher costs include software licensing, maintenance, and support requirements, like web conferencing or simulation and other discipline-specific software, campus technology support that's specific to the online course and program, it might be content and software integration with learning management systems, troubleshooting, technical fixes, individualized professional development for faculty teaching online, staff, for instance, at Metropolitan State University <coughs> Center for Online Learning, partner with faculty in the design of online courses and the effective use of technology. Lake Superior College's program for online excellence in teaching includes three parts, an administrative tool for evaluation of faculty members' online teaching, an online peer review process that evaluates both course design and pedagogy, and online training for new and experienced instructors. Uh, we also have many of our courses that participate in a peer review process through Quality Matters, which charges $1,000 per course. Riverland, for example, has 74 courses that participate in that um, continuous improvement evaluation process. Student support services for online students. Students that are online students need access to services that are not necessarily or even likely available on a location in normal business hours when the student might be there. Admission and advising staff is done at a distance. Students who are unfamiliar with the online learning environment um, or heavily engaged in their coursework, generate emails and chats and phone calls, which our faculty answer nearly 24-7. <laughs> uh, and then finally, through our accrediting agencies, the Higher <laughs> Learning Commission distinguishes between correspondence courses and distance or online courses. <laughs> distance courses must have regular and substantive interaction between the instructor and the students. To interact individually and personally online in large online classes is challenging and time consuming. So some colleges, in fact, limit class size for online courses to levels that are lower than their course sizes on campus. Anoka Ramsey, for instance, caps online enrollment at 35 students. So a general psychology class in person might have 60 students while the online class has 35 students. We have some fundamental questions about the bill, Mr. Chair. Um, it's not clear to us if this language is meant to be prospective or retrospective. Would we be expected to cut the rates we currently have in place 
Uh, were we to do that, it would be a substantial uh, revenue impact for the programs that are being delivered. Uh, is, it a, is it meant to apply just to undergraduate courses or to graduate courses as well? That's not understood by us. Uh, and then finally, we don't know how we would make an assessment as to whether there are comparable on-campus programs, when in fact, by its nature, online is not comparable to a campus class. We're very concerned that if this bill is adopted, colleges and universities will be forced to drop these programs. This is not something that we can make up in volume. There is demand for these programs, and we're serving that demand at the lowest cost in Minnesota. The campuses have extraordinary costs, and these costs need to be covered somehow. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I hope, Senator um, Isaacson, that answered your question about cost, cost models. Senator Isaacson. So uh, I don't know that there's anybody up here that has advocated more for funding for our schools to pay for our, I'm not sure there's anybody here that's done that than I have. Uh, I'm also teaching at these schools, and I have taught online courses. I was not aware of the money you're talking about, nor does the online courses I've been able to teach substantively changed other than my interactions with them, which, by the way, I'm not compensated more for. So I'm a little concerned about um, the broad stroke at which that could happen. Uh, don't get me wrong. Courses that will require software or programming or something that's intensive, if that's a part of what gets it done, I'm not going to have a problem with that because I don't like us operating at a loss that doesn't help anybody. But in my situation and in, like, in communications, there's no substantive difference in terms of the, what we use. D2L is already there. We're already doing all the things you're talking about that I could already do in all my in-person in classes. And so I'm just a little concerned about whether or not there's a broad stroke being used here. And, I, and uh, that doesn't necessarily apply in your comments to courses that I think a lot of humanities teaching where we're not engaging or the software isn't needed beyond the D2L platform, which does adequately provide me with options. The second point I would make um, is that I, at the same time, I'm, I'm especially sensitive to the idea that we're trying to create as much revenue as we can because we're not taking care of business here at the Capitol the way we should. I'm just not sure that I'm comfortable with this way because I'm not sure, based on the testimony you just provided, uh, that that's exactly how it's actually being carried out on the campuses. Not that I don't think you're trying to be accurate. I think that uh, when you look at specifically the classes that I've seen and taught, I'm not sure I see a correlation of why it would cost more, nor I'd be pleasantly surprised to see lower class sizes, which I also have not experienced in online course teaching. So uh, I'm not sure that all of it's falling under the same umbrella you just presented for us. Uh, and so I, at the same time, would caution us to be thoughtful about how we're approaching it so we're not creating more holes that way. Uh, we've got to find a way, and frankly, this is just because the legislature needs to do its part more and be more supportive of the university system in general, which is my opinion. Thanks. Thank you, Senator Isaacson. I think um, you know a question I have, Vice Chancellor King, is: I mean, when you just strictly have the cost of online classes, uh, are you saying that online classes cost more than a traditional class? I understand all the other additional. Uh, costs involved with a running an institution, but are you, are you saying that an online class costs more than a traditional classroom class? Mr. Chair, I'm not saying that without exception. I'm saying that substantially so. Uh, we do have online classes. Uh, I, I imagine we do. I haven't looked at the 3,800 programs in our tuition table, but I would venture that there are some online classes that do not have a differential tuition, but there are substantially uh, it is substantially the case that there are added costs for de online delivery. Members, any additional? Uh, Senator Claussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. K could you uh, repeat those? You, you gave us some numbers about how many courses are really offered uh, that are online, I believe. Um, and then could you, uh, do you have the figure for revenue for total uh, online courses across the system, what the revenue is for those. It's Chancellor King. Uh, certainly, Mr. Chair and Senator Claussen, uh, we have 3,800 academic programs. Uh, 559 um, are delivered through what we characterize as Online Plus, which is a blend of classroom and online instruction. And 134 are exclusively online. Senator Claussen, follow-up. 
Yes, thank you. Do you have a, a figure for what the revenue uh, for those courses is, total revenue? Vice Chancellor King. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Claussen, the total revenue um, for those courses uh, is $207 million. You're welcome. Sir. Thank you. Remember, seeing no uh, additional comments or questions, um, Senator Dreheim, any final comments? No, Chair. Thank you, Senator Dreheim. And with that, uh, we will lay over uh, Senate File 1473 for possible inclusion in the Higher Education Omnibus Bill. Senator Anderson is uh, bringing forward Senate File 1583. Uh, would you like to move your, your bill, Senator Anderson? Would I like to move uh, Senate File 1583 for possible inclusion? Thank you. So moved. And I do have, uh, Mr. Chair, I do have the A1 amendment. Uh, wondering if that's in your packets. Yes, it is. To the amendment. Mr. Chair and members, it's just on page uh, one, line one, uh, six. We just wanted to make sure this is clarified. Uh, after four, insert in-state undergraduate students. And uh, page one, line nine, after rates, insert four undergraduate students. Senator Anderson moves the A1 amendment. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? A1 moves. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair uh, and members. Senate file 1583 seeks to bring some certainty, stability, and a reduced financial debt burden for the students and families of our public higher education institutions. We do this by freezing tuition at the University of Minnesota and Minnesota State and reducing tuition by 1% at our state's two-year colleges. Understandably, this bill has met both strong support and strong uh, opposition and you're gonna hear about that today. I bring this forward not as a silver bullet to addressing college costs, but instead to continue the important conversation and efforts around college affordability and the unsustainable rising costs for students and their families. I also bring this with consideration for Minnesota taxpayers who have been subsidizing tuition. We owe them more. Members, the average Minnesota student is now graduating college with just over $30,000 in debt. Students at our two-year colleges still pay some of the highest tuition and fees, uh, fee rates in the country, eighth highest. The good news is that we've made progress on this front as we have moved down from a higher watermark of third a few years ago. And I wanna thank the institutions for this effort, but we can, we can and must do more. If we're to meet our workforce needs, we will need an affordable and accessible higher education system that every Minnesotan has the opportunity to pursue if they are willing and able. Make no mistake, we have wonderful higher education systems in Minnesota. However, we simply can't continue to do business as usual. It's simply un unsustainable. As a legislature, we need to do everything we can to ensure the students and families and taxpayers are the priority in higher education. An obvious question about this bill for some is how much does it cost the systems? That's a fair question, but not the most important one in my view. And looks at the problem from the wrong end. I believe the more important question is when and how will our systems reform and change how they do business and curb the unsustainable increase in spending year after year after year and help us protect the students? We heard it in this committee last week that even under the governor's budget proposal, his best attempt, 
students could face a tuition increase of 7%. That's unacceptable, and we can do more, and we must expect more in terms of accountability and results. We have some tough financial decisions ahead of us, and I assure members of this committee that I will work hard to maximize the target we receive in this committee. That said, we need to start a different conversation regarding higher education. The solution is not more money. That's easy. But that's not leadership or what we are expected to do. <coughs> we must work with the institutions to expect, drive, and deliver results. We need to drive innovation and accountability. We need to offer reforms. We need to focus on what's best for existing students to prepare them for prosperity in Minnesota's workforce, not the burden of debilitating debt. And we need to protect prospective students so that tuition increases aren't a roadblock from attending in the first place. Members, I have some students with me who would like to share how tuition increases could impact them in their educational journey. Let's hear what they have to say. Thank you. Yeah, um, Frankie Bruselet Bruchere. Sorry, I butchered your name, Frankie. Sorry, Sorry about that. <laughs> State your name for the record. Thank you. For the record, Chair, uh, my name is Frankie Becerra. Uh, I'm the president of Lead MN, the statewide student association representing 120,000 Minnesota community and technical college students in the great state of Minnesota. I'm here today along with students from around the state in support of Senate File 1583. Over the past six years, the tuition freezes at the Minnesota State Community and Technical Colleges has led and allowed our colleges to drop from the third most expensive in the nation down to eighth. This has allowed many students to continue pursuing their education without fear that tuition costs could jump before they complete their degree or that they would be priced out of college. And our students are extremely grateful that the legislature has put in these tuition freezes. But while we have made positive progress, we still remain above the national average for the cost of attending a community and technical college, and our students are extremely concerned that the potential for tuition increase is looking more and more likely every day. Far too many of our low to middle income students find themselves without enough financial aid to make college affordable. Our students work multiple jobs, such as myself, that just make ends meet and cover the costs of education. These students are putting the work in to pursue and pay for their education, but still many are falling short. These students, for these students, even a 1% increase would have a significant impact on their ability to go to college. Ultimately, most of our students are forced to rely on high levels of student loans to finance their education and complete their degree. In a recent report by Lead MN, we found that for many of our students, there is not one single affordable community or technical college unless a student has to rely on high amounts of student loans. 61% of the 2017 graduating class at Minnesota Community and Technical Colleges graduated with student loan debt. The medium amount of debt for these students was $16,000, with a national student loan debt that exceeds over $1.5 trillion, rising levels of student loan debt are forcing many college graduates to delay purchases to homes, wait to start a family, hold off on opening small businesses, and preventing them from investing in their future. At a time where Minnesota State is in the midst of a major workforce shortage and needs more employees with a post-secondary credential, more needs to be done to make our community and technical colleges affordable and accessible. Allowing tuition to rise will close the door for many of our students who could benefit most from a college degree and would further contribute to declining enrollment. As president of Lead MN, I've traveled across the state and talked to hundreds of students, and I can tell you that too many of our community and technical college students are struggling to afford what is supposed to be the entry point for higher education and what should be a pathway to the middle class. Our students face a real challenge on a daily basis, and raising their tuitions will make completing the degree even more difficult. Today, I have students with me from around the state that would like to share why they support Senate File 1538. Chair Dreheim and members of the board, I urge you to support Senate File 1583. 
for the record, along with increased investments in our students and colleges as the legislative session moves forward. Over the last six years, you have supported students by freezing or lowering tuition through the state budget. With your help, we can make sure that this session, students truly do come first. I would now like to invite Christian Hubble, a student from Minneapolis College, to testify. Thank you. Before we get going, we do have a, a question from Senator Isaacson. So, Senator Isaacson. Okay. Many moons ago, I was a student body president that advocated very similar things and successfully fought for a tuition freeze in the university system where I represented. And uh, I can tell you that nothing uh, is more exciting to me and maybe in a slightly nerdy way if you're a student advocate of student government about seeing students being active in student government. That, uh, that is exactly how I ended up where I'm here today. Whether that's a good or bad thing, some will tell you differently. But nonetheless, it's really what got me to this point was my experience of being in the chair much like you folks and testifying on something I'm very passionate about. Um, <clears throat> I have to ask, uh, Senator Anderson, are you advocating in any way for contraction of the university system here in Minn State? Senator Eisenstein, Mr. Chair, Senator Eisenstein, uh, a contraction? Yeah, where we would be closing down schools. Uh, no. Do you see that as a goal or something that is a possible way of solving the problem we're talking about? Mr. Chair, Senator Eisenstein, no. I didn't think so. Mr. Chair, if I can continue. Senator Eisenstein. The problem with a tuition freeze when it is not accompanied with the other side of the coin is all you end up doing is hurting your schools and their inability to provide for you what you need. As a professor on the inside who's watched over the last 10 years that we've been cutting and slashing school budgets, forcing administrators to tight, cut the fat and to tighten things up, and now watching where the cuts come down to places like uh, less janitorial staff or less offerings or less opportunities or less student services, right? Don't get me wrong. No one wants to see tuition go down more than I do. My whole goal as a legislator has been to move us back towards the idea that the state takes more responsibility than the student does, because we've completely flipped that. There's no question about that the state has a relationship to driving up tuition when we continue to take a disinvestment approach to higher education. But when you pick this route, which doesn't have in it the amendment I'm gonna add, hopefully, which I doubt, we'll go through, but I'm gonna give it a shot. Um, that involves, allows for the funding so the universities can do what it needs to do, you're just simply cutting off your hands to get this job done because you're putting the school in a situation where it can provide less opportunity, thus devaluing your diploma. Because your diploma isn't just something that's valuable now, it's valuable over the next 20 years as you use that diploma to find jobs and talk about your technical skills or your trade. And so the problem with this bill is it's fundamentally myopic when it comes to seeing a long-term approach to solving this issue. It'd be different, it'd be much systemically different if we had not spent a significant portion of time over the last 10 years calling on the university system to cut their funding, to cut their administrative overruns, to cut the fat out of their schools. But we have been doing that, right? And so now what you're gonna be cutting is muscle. And I would argue that Senator Anderson's idea that we we're looking at the wrong way is exactly the wrong way. Because the reality is, is that if we take responsibility for funding our universities like we're supposed to, we will continue to have the universities we've had. Senator Anderson wants you, but if I can finish my thought. Is that all right? Go ahead, Senator okay. Isaacson. If we continue, if we look back and move towards funding our universities in the way that we were meant to, the way we had historically in the past, we will continue to have the schools that produce the brightest, brightest and the best. The problem here is not that the university system is evil because it's trying to suck money out of your pockets. The problem here is the legislator, legislator hasn't had the political will to do what it needs to do. That's the problem, because they've not made our education a priority. The reason why we have number one voter turnout, most Fortune 500 companies per capita, the reason why we take care of having the most nonprofits and civic activism, and are ranked consistently one of the best places in the country to live, it's because our education system is so strong, and it's producing good folks like you and me. But if we continue to take this backdoor approach, tie their hands and they're not providing the funding they need, all we're doing is cutting our own legs off. Now I've got all four limbs covered, I think. We're good. So I, that's my initial thoughts. I'm happy to go. I've got an amendment, but I think Senator Anderson would like to respond to my comments. 
Well, Mr. Senator. Chair and Senator Isaacson, it, it would be really great to have our testifiers be able to finish before we start getting into the bill. So I'd really like to continue with the right. students and, and, and give them that opportunity like sure. you did, Senator Isaacson, yeah. so many years ago yeah. when uh, you sat at this table. And I want to hear all of it. A senator or representative didn't Mr. cut Chair. you off before you had the chance. So, uh, Mr. Chair, let's oh, that's proceed a bit with disingenuous, the disingenuous, please. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, Mr. Hubble, please continue. Sorry you about that. Sure. Uh, Mr. Chair, <laughs> members of the committee, thank you. For the record, my name is Christian Hubble, and I am a student at Minneapolis College. I enrolled in college for the first time after spending, spending a decade in the workforce with only a high school diploma. Working dead-end jobs, climbing ladders to nowhere, and managing my post-traumatic stress disorder while being exploited by a numerous amount of employers, I decided to make the decision to go back to school, school for the first time and pursue a degree in business management, hoping that it would provide me with a path to, uh, to a good paying job and economic stability. I'm now currently in my second semester at Minneapolis College. I work 20 hours a week as a program director for a local not-for-profit in Southside. I work 20 hours a week in my administrative work study. I spend my weekends working catering shifts on top of my 17 credit course load. That's what I got going on right now. <laughs> I have nothing to show for it. By the mercy of a dear friend, I am able to live rent free. But a medical emergency that resulted in me having to get surgery landed me in six collections agencies with a credit score of 520. I have never used a credit card in my life, and I've never lived beyond my means, but that's still my circumstance. My refrigerator is currently empty, and I typically eat about one meal a day because of my food pantry that's on my campus. I believe that if a man does not work, he does not eat. And I believe that hard work should pay off. But I worry that I may be believing a lie. Growing up, students like myself were always told that going to college was necessary if we wanted to get a, a decent paying job and pursue our dreams. I fear myself and others have been misled. Too many of our community and technical college students, like myself, are working multiple jobs to, to pay for our education, but still being forced to rely on student loans. Unlike students 20 years ago, it is extremely difficult to work your way through college and be able to pay for your education. By cutting tuition 1% and preventing a tuition increase the following year, the legislator would provide students like me the opportunity to work towards completing our degree without being forced to rely on outside aid for our most basic needs. Today, I ask that you provide that opportunity for the thousands of college students that share my story by supporting this tuition freeze proposed in SF 1583. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I think next up we have Lauren Fryersing, I hope I didn't butcher that too much. Please state your name for the record. Um, my name is Brandy Olson. Um, I will be reading Lauren Fryersinger's testimony as she had a last minute scheduling conflict, but still wanted to make sure that her voice was heard. Thank you. Um, my name is Brandy Olson. I'm the president of Student Senate at, my, at Ridgewater College Hutchinson. Um, Lauren Firesinger's testimony reads as, my name is Lauren Firesinger and I am currently serving as Student Senate President at Minneapolis College. Being a student at Minneapolis College in this beautiful state has opened up doors I never imagined possible. I arrived in the United States in late 2014 from Botswana, Southern Africa. At the time, I was doing a culture ex exchange program and I lived with an amazing host family who would later sponsor my student visa. I chose to go back to school because I wanted to improve my chances of getting a better job, a better quality of life, and broaden my way of thinking by interacting with um, people from various backgrounds. Being that I'm an immigrant, I was determined to learn from people 
with, from various backgrounds. Um, I was determined to learn anything and everything I could possibly learn with the intention of bringing, bridging the gap between our two nations, regardless of how small the impact. I've already amassed a wealth of knowledge that has helped catapult me into various pla platforms of leadership. You see, as an international student, I'm not eligible for financial aid or the Pell Grant. I knew this was the case when I made the decision to study here, and I fully understand why it is so. As it stands, though, tuition is not necessarily cheap. It's been an uphill battle to pay out of pocket, and that's not even including the cost of textbooks, annual health insurance, the cost of rent, food, gas, or any other incidentals. Today, I am really here to ask you to consider the proposed 1% tuition reduction. I'm here because past students advocated for and pa paved the way for me and others. They advocated for the tuition freeze, and with your support, that became a reality. That tuition freeze allowed me to enroll at a community college. It allowed me to begin a journey I never thought possible. And now that I'm here, I see the value in affordable tuition and access to higher education for all students. Where I come from, you don't dare dream of going to school in the United States unless you're part of the elite or unless you receive some sort of scholarship. Both of those options were not available to me when I moved to the United States, but I was able to find the doors, my way to the doors of a community college and defied all odds of participating in higher education in this country. Though rewarding, this journey has been filled with incredible hurdles, as previously hinted. The reality of most college and technical most community and college technical students in this country is that life below the poverty line is part of our story. I'm no exception. During, during school holidays and breaks, I've had only the walls of my apartments when others had went home to be with their families. I've had to remind myself that the sacrifice I made to school, to stay in school, will be worth it in the end. Mr. Chair and committee members, I don't share these details to sensationalize my struggles. I share these details to let you know that even though tuition is costly, I am able to get by thanks to the tuition freeze. I've been able to make sacrifices and I know that I knew would allow me to attend college. If tuition increased, the chances of completing my last two years of coursework become impossible mountain to scale. Being an international student lately has felt like living in a place of constant fear, fear that things will change and that our voices will go unheard, fear of being labeled as lazy or expecting handouts, when all that we ask is that our narratives are lived and lived experience is be considered as well. Today my fear is that I, tuition would, is that my tuition would indeed increase, leaving students like me to figure out how not to crash from the fear of not having money to complete my education. Not completing my degree would be a reminder that I had no place here at all, that indeed higher education in this awesome country and the state that is luxury that only the elite can afford. But that regular hardworking, well-meaning folks like myself don't belong and never will unless by some miracle. Some of you already may know that Botswana is considered a well-being nation. My hope is that I and other young people can go back home and transfer the skills and knowledge that we acquire from our travels and education abroad to affect the necessary systems of change so that we can achieve growth and become a developed nation like yours. I am also here on behalf, behalf of 8,000 students I represent on my campus. A tuition increase means that working mothers and fathers can't afford to return or stay in school and improve their quality of life and give their children better opportunities. This proposed increase also means that students have to make a decision to either pay rent, put food on their tables, pay for heat, pay for tuition, or face the prospect of being highly mobile. I hope, that this, I hope it's evident that I love this state, this land of 10,000 lakes and opportunities, because in those 10,000 opportunities, I found mine, and I strive to make the most of it. I know this is not an easy decision, but I ask on behalf of the international students in this state, and on behalf of all our community and technical college students, that you maintain a tuition freeze. We ask that you believe in us and invest in the future workforce of this state, and in my specific case, invest in the future of international trade and development for a better tomorrow and for our future generations. Thank you, ladies. Thank you for your time, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, and thank you for reading that. Um, I have one more student down, uh, Matt Benjamin. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Matthew Benjamin. I'm here today 
on behalf of Lita Man and the 120,000 plus two-year community and technical college students in the great state of Minnesota in support of Senate File 1583. We, as college students, face many issues such as financial hardships, food insecurities, and the ever-rising cost of textbooks. Many students, like me, find it difficult to manage paying for co college, working to survive, and raising our families. We live in a state that has over $27 billion in student loan debt. That's money that we as students don't have to buy cars, homes, and other things that drive our local economies. It's $27 billion that we don't have to provide for our families and our loved ones. To invest in starting new businesses and money we don't have to help in our communities. One reason for this massive amount of student loan debt is the fact that we, as students in Minnesota, pay the eighth highest tuition in the nation. Today I'd like to tell you my story. I'm an older than average student. I served our country on active duty in the United States Marine Corps for five years, during which time I'd have the honor of deploying with the British Royal Navy aboard the HMS Ark Royal and serving one tour in the Middle East in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom. I am also a student and recently had the distinct joy of having my first child. As a two-year community and technical college student, I have struggled to make ends meet. I often find myself wondering if I should be buying gas to get to school, formula for the baby, diapers, pay the rent, or do I need to buy food for my girlfriend and myself? I have become fluent in the art of juggling the bills to stretch every dollar to its fullest potential. I work two jobs, putting in, on average, 35 to 50 hours a week. On top of this workload, I still attend college full time. This leads to many hours at night, sitting in the basement, doing homework away from my girlfriend and daughter. I miss spending the time with them, but I know that the sacrifice is for the good of all three of us. Unfortunately, the better future I'm looking forward to is overshadowed by the mountain of student loans waiting to be repaid just a few short months after graduation. With no guaranteed job after graduation and a family to support, this causes many restless nights worrying about the future. I remember mauling the decision to drop out of school when I found out my girlfriend was pregnant. I was barely getting by the way it was, paying my own bills and without a baby to worry about feeding, clothing, and taking care of. My girlfriend has been a huge supporter of my staying in college and worked as many hours as possible to help take some of the financial burden off me. So much so that she was even working the day she went into labor and finish a shift because she knew we needed the money. Senate File 1583 would help address some of the financial hardships we as college students are facing. We are not asking for a handout, rather we just want the ability to work our way through college the same way people could 20 years ago. If we adopt Senate File 1583, that will help students like myself and so many others be able to afford to attend and remain in our two-year community and technical colleges. With an estimated shortage of 420,000 degrees to fill the available jobs in Minnesota by the end of 2020, we need as, we need as many of these students to succeed as possible. I have had the privilege of serving the students of Minnesota Community and Technical College Moorhead Campus on the student government during this time, I have listened to many of my fellow students who have the same struggles as I've shared with you today. I strongly urge you to pass this bill and help the students of Minnesota succeed. I thank you for your time, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Thank you and thank you for your service and congratulations on your, your first child. Thank uh, you, Senator Mr. Anderson, Chair. I think we have two more testifiers that we're running short of time. So. Exactly, and Mr. Chair, I just uh, I so appreciate the the, uh, the comments by our students, and I, I want to make sure we get the systems up here to be able to respond in a fair manner if, if it's if it's possible for members. I know Senator Isaacson has a couple amendments. just want to just beg your attention for a little bit longer on this important conversation, so thank you. 
Thank you. So if we could have uh, the U and uh, Min State up uh, for quick comments, and then we'll uh, we'll get to Senator Isaacson as the first on the list, and Senator Clausen. Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm Brian Burnett. I'm the Senior Vice President for Finance and Operations at the University of Minnesota. Thank you for the opportunity to testify this afternoon. Um, we share Chair Anderson's belief that the University of Minnesota must set tuition rates at a level that makes the institution affordable and accessible for Minnesota residents. This is a principle we apply for all our students across all our campuses. Our current tuition uh, situation is this. This is why our Board of Regents under President Kaler's leadership has held tuition increases to an average of 1.2% for Minnesota resident undergraduates on the Twin Cities campus and 0.4% on the greater Minnesota campuses during his tenure as president. It is why we have looked to raise the rate of tuition for non-resident, non-reciprocity undergraduate students closer to the middle of the Big Ten as a measure of equity with students within the state of Minnesota. It is also why we have reallocated over $90 million of administrative costs to higher priority areas over the last six years. This amount for fiscal 19 is equal to a 4.1% tuition increase or about $500 per student that we have cut out of the institution in various areas to fund higher purposes. And it is why we have put an emphasis on lowering the overall debt burden for Minnesota students by boosting our scholarship programs and ensuring students can graduate in four years. Now at 71% on the Twin Cities campus, or number two among public institutions in the Big Ten. The best way to reduce student debt is have them graduate in four years. And we're now at a 71% rate on the Twin Cities campus. Challenges with this legislation is that the Board of Regents elected by the legislature have the sole authority to set tuition rates at the university. If they would choose to follow the intent of this legislation, the impact on the university's budget for the next two years would be significant. At this point, factoring in the full university request for in incremental new funding over the biennium of 87 million, our planning includes a tuition revenue increase from resident undergraduates of around $27 million. That $27 million revenue increase combined with the requested $87 million in new state funding in, and additionally adding another $30 million of internal reallocations or cuts across our system is what's needed to maintain the current scope and quality of programming across all three of our missions, instruction, research, and public service. The loss of the potential tuition revenue creates a significant hole in our budget we need those additional resources to address general inflationary increases, the extraordinary inflation we face on health care costs and other areas of our operation, and we need to shore up some er critical areas with significant financial challenges, and the need to attract and retain talent the, the in institution needs to have the best and brightest faculty to be able to teach our students. Freezing tuition for the resident undergrads for the next biennium across all campuses would exponentially increase the importance of new state funding, and it would lead potentially to reductions in scope and quality of the university. It would have negative implications for our research projects we are able to support, the programming we deliver across the state, and the classroom and service experiences for our students. So in conclusion, Mr. Chairman, the university has great concerns about this Senate filing, and we appreciate your time and attention. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your testimony. Mr. Chair, members, Laura King, Vice Chancellor for Finance at Minnesota State. Thank you, Senator Anderson, for the opportunity to speak today uh, in, in regards to this bill. We were before your committee a few weeks ago and outlined our fiscal 2021 operating budget request. Our request is built on three goals, student success, uh, improvement in the financial sustainability of our colleges and universities, and continuing our commitment to improving our performance on diversity and inclusion. Keeping tuition affordable is a priority of the Minnesota State Board of Trustees. Um, I hope today's testimony really reinforces uh, the reason we structured our budget request the way we did with a request for state 
support to enable us to avoid a tuition increase. College tuition was last increased in the fall of 2012, which was now seven years ago. And since then, college tuition has been held flat in three years, reduced by 1% in a year, and then frozen uh, in the remaining years. Uh, the bill proposes to freeze university tuition for two years at the fiscal 19 rates and decrease tuition at the colleges in fiscal 20 uh, and then freeze it at that lower level in fiscal 21. While affordability is and will continue to be a priority for us, ensuring the resources that we need to operate our colleges and universities in a financial sustainable way is also a board and I, and I would venture a legislative priority. You have heard us testify about the extraordinary and damaging disinvestment that's taken place in Minnesota higher education in the last 20 years. You heard my colleague talk about the reallocations at the University of Minnesota. Similarly, our colleges and universities have reallocated $150 million in just the last four years, closing programs, living with aging technology and building infrastructure, and withdrawing our programming. Our system headcount is down 10% since 2012, and the challenge we face when talking about freezing tuition is that people often equate the cost of a tuition freeze with the amount of the tuition revenue that would have been generated with a tuition increase, and it's not the case. It's actually the cost to cover inflationary expenses. Minnesota State has two primary sources of revenue to fund operating costs, state appropriation, and tuition. And recall we had a table in our presentation a few weeks ago illustrating that our revenue has increased on average 1% a year over the last 10 years. We have not had extraordinary increases in revenue. In fact, when you adjust that number for inflation, our rate of increase on an annual basis is more like one-tenth of 1%. If tuition is frozen for two years at the universities and reduced at the colleges in fiscal 20 and then frozen at that level in fiscal 21, State appropriation would be needed to fund both the estimated tuition revenue loss and inflationary expenses. Tuition would not be available to help us cover those costs. We would um, cost that at about $156 million uh, in the fiscal note that was requested yesterday by the author's staff. Uh, that's the number you'll see from us. Our 2020-2021 request included sufficient new state revenue to cover a 3% operating cost increase without raising undergraduate tuition. Since tuition is nearly half of our revenue at 49%, it takes an increase of 2% in state support to avoid an increase of 1% in tuition. State support and tuition work together. If there's interest in this bill, then I hope there's also interest in funding the full request that we submitted for operating inflation at 169 million. Without support for both those pieces, our campuses face severe financial consequences. I can say without hesitation that you will hear about layoffs and program closures and service retractions in our communities across the state. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chancellor. Real quick, Senator Anderson, do you yep. have any response to that before we go to the questions? Mr. Chair, I just want to um, reiterate, I, I have tremendous respect. I think everyone on this committee has tremendous respect for our institutions here in Minnesota. And this is this bill was not presented and dropped uh, and taken lightly. Um, this is a this is an issue that has been gone on for too long. We heard last week that since 1975, the inflation when it comes to higher education is 3.7%. Um, we've got over I think it was 1750 buildings in the two systems. We've got, we've, th these are tremendous systems that are putting out our workforce. And so absolutely this is, this is incredibly uh, important. We've got a systematic problem here that we're trying to address. And in this conversation, when you talk about, and to my remarks earlier, if it's not gonna be us who is gonna have the hard conversation about tuition increases, then who? And if not now, when? Uh, this has gone on year after year after year. And again, in this conversation, I appreciate uh, any comments by other senators, but we need to be bold and we need to have this conversation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Senator Anderson. Uh, Senator Isaacson. I wanna sidebar directly to the students real quick. Uh, just, just so you're aware, 25 years ago, I worked uh, five to two every day 
five nights a week as a waiter and then worked, went to school full time. So I, I'm not sure it was quite as rosy as you might think it was back then. We struggled to get through school as well. And let me say that your anger and frustration and the grit you're showing is righteous. And I agree with you. You have simply just picked the wrong villain. That isn't the university system. You're looking at them. It's this group right here. If you should be frustrated with anybody, it's a legislature that does not take this mandate seriously. That's the problem. The problem is, is that we continue to think that we can pass this down the road and put little slights and little cuts and death by a thousand cuts to this university system, university system without giving them what they need to be successful. That's the reality. I differ in my opinion from uh, Chair Anderson, uh, and I understand with all due respect that I think this is an important conversation to have, and I respect that we're having it, but the reality is, is it's two fundamentally different approaches. One that's saying we have to look inwardly and find more places to find efficiencies to make it better, and the other one saying we as a state have to fundamentally be willing to invest in our future. That's where I stand with this. I think we should pass this tuition freeze if we agree that we're also going to fund them at the 3.7% rate every year. In fact, I would have an indefinite tuition freeze. I'd support that ongoing as long as we knew our funding was going to match the increase of inflation. Inflation in a university system is not the same as just inflation for an individual. You have to understand the nuances of what happens economically for a university system that isn't just like a normal business. It's like a large business. And you look at the way we, we have to look at the talent we bring in for professors, the way book contracts are, are set, which is a whole other problem we need to discuss. You have to look at the assets we have to take care of across the state. Yeah, tuition or inflation is a little higher, and it's our job to take care of that. And the reason why you're in the spot you're in right now is not because of the University of Minnesota and Minn State. It's because your state legislators have not taken the responsibility to take that burden off you and give you the access. That's the problem. So I understand your frustration. I resonate with your frustration. I think about your frustration every day. I have it in my students that I teach every day. But the problem is that our state has not been willing to make the tough decisions to fund education when we need to, to guarantee in the future the kind of system we have. So it'd be different, and this is why I think this bill's a bit tone deaf, it'd be different if it hadn't came off eight years of serious questions and queries and cuts on many levels to what they needed to have done, ignoring the realities of inflation. If that hadn't happened, I think I'd be much warmer to what Senator Anderson's bringing forward, because then I'd want us to look at that. But I know we have done that. I've seen the cuts firsthand in my interactions in the schools I teach at, both Metro State and Century. This bill does not make your schools better. It will make your schools worse, and you'll be paying mediocre amounts for a mediocre education. Support what the legislature to actually get something done and have a backbone and fund those schools, and then your burden becomes less. Thank you. Senator Eber, to that point, and then yeah, we I just, have Senator I just Foster. wanted to comment, you know, I, maybe we should have more time in this discussion since we're over time now, but I just, Senator Isaacson, I have a lot of regard for you, but I am not taking my responsibility lightly about this topic. We do our best to craft budgets the best we can, and uh, so to say that I do not take my this slightly and we're just ignoring it all is uh, totally wrong and I'm not tone deaf to the students who testified I think they're remarkable so I'll leave it at that thank you Senator Claussen thank you Mr. Chair and thank you students for uh, your testimony and being here and sharing your stories it's it's uh, very important it's very moving I appreciate that I would if, if you're willing just by a show of hands of the students in your how many of you qualify and receive Minnesota State Grant? Are you willing to just raise your hand? How many of you receive Minnesota State Grant dollars? Could I ask how many receive Pell Grants? Could I ask again, how many of you uh, that this is a range between $500 and $1,000 you receive annually? Those of you over $1,000? Those of you over $1,500? Anyone above that, $1,500? Okay. I appreciate you. That, that helps me understand a little bit more. I, I appreciate you willing to share that information. Um, it's a tough issue. It really is. And, We've had these discussions, and we somehow we need to find a solution. So, uh, Senator Anderson, thanks for initiating the discussion. Senator Cohen. Uh, 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a couple of disparate comments. First of all, and, and I obviously, like everybody else, appreciate uh, what students are going through these days. When I compare it to, to my student days, uh, it's striking. And I went to a, a very expensive school, and, uh, uh, and now everything is expensive, uh, far beyond what uh, what I could what I might might have comprehended uh, years ago. Um, so a, a, a couple of things. First of all, Senator Anderson, I'm not sure how we get how your bill gets around the constitutional autonomy of the University of Minnesota. And I recognize that the students who've testified today are Men's State students. Obviously, we we can do what we want with Men's State, but I'm not sure how we deal with with that constitutional autonomy for the University of Minnesota. We can make a recommendation to them, but we can't uh, actually by by statute mandate what we do it with with uh, the university. Um, and I'm forced to to defend myself a little bit relative to Senator Isaacson, because in 2013, when I was chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, I set a target for this division that provided $150 million in support uh, for higher education in, in the state. But I would concur with Senator Isaacson that, that we've been remiss generally over the years as to what we've done with higher education. And, uh, and I'm very fearful for everybody in this room, legislators, students, uh, representatives from the systems. The, uh, the budget forecast of last week, which was not a surprise, it's something that I talked about two years ago on the Senate floor, that we needed to watch out as to what was gonna happen. Um, I'm not gonna quote old speeches of mine right now, but members will look forward to my quoting old speeches of mine. When I said that we passed a budget that was unsustainable, um, and it's led to exactly where we are today. Um, and I'm not sure how we get out of this conundrum of trying to provide for reasonable support for students, both in terms of, of what we do with tuition as well as what we do with the state uh, uh, grant program, um, and what we do with the systems, as uh, Ms. King in particular, and she knows from her previous life as uh, Commissioner of Finance what, uh, what the state budget uh, uh, can be like to deal with. I'm not sure how we're gonna get out of this conundrum this year uh, we can try to invent money, we can try to take money from other places in significant ways, but we have uh, a budget forecast that provides for exactly zero dollars in terms of ongoing money. And uh, it's going to be very difficult to get out of that and puts everybody in a vice that uh, this year in particular is going to be quite difficult. Uh, even arguably more difficult in, in some ways than the uh, significant deficits of 2011-2012, which I had never, at any point during that time, never suggested it was the fault of legislators or governors. Uh, that was an international economic crisis that was far beyond the scope of the state of Minnesota. So we have some real difficult times uh, in this particular session trying to deal with uh, the issues that uh, Senator Anderson brings in front of us. Senator Jensen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I just want to say thank you, Mr. Senator Anderson, for bringing this to us. This bill has a lot to it, and we could discuss this for a long time, but I think Senator Cohen says it well, and I appreciate Senator Isaacson's uh, uh, passion, uh, but I especially appreciate your willingness to, um, to bring this to us and, uh, if you will, um, force us to have these kinds of discussions. Thank you. Senator Abler. Thank you and just to the bill, and I, this is a really hard topic, and actually, Senator Cohen, I actually listened to and appreciated your speech on the floor, and I actually agreed with you as you gave your comments. Um, so just to the institutions that we're talking about, to the U and, and Minnesota State, uh, we are in a really challenging spot, and people will debate long past our tenure here, who caused what, but here we are. And uh, so what this, and Senator Anderson, thank you for <clears throat> taking a run at this topic. And let me just help recontextualize what Senator Anderson's bill does. As a person who has proposed time and again uh, reducing uh, specific jobs at Minnesota State back when it was Minsk U and criticizing the U for bloated administrative costs, what this would do would require that you would actually, that the, that the institutions would look at themselves and how shall they best spend their money. And if I were going to have an amendment, it would be that they cannot cut programs that serve these amazing uh, students who are here who are doing their best to take advantage of what we have. The systems get a lot of money, and maybe it's you know, not enough for everything they can think of to do, but it's enough to do everything that they have to do. 
And in the world of human services, where we're forever retrenching and trying to focus our, our needs, I would urge the both of you and Minnesota State to decide what's essential, what's important, and what's nice. What this bill is going to do um, is going to help you decide not to do what's nice, but do what's essential, what's important. And I think there's plenty of money for that. Thank you. Senator Newton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I, first of all, I want to preface what I'm going to say with I, I think this is the wrong forum for us to, you know, we should be having a discussion before we bring a bill forward like this because in a short amount of time we're not able to, to really go into the depth of a subject like this and, and all of the, the aspects of it. And to my good friend, Mr. Abler, uh, I want to remind him that one size does not fit all. When it comes to Anoka Ramsey Community College, for example, the best community college in the state, the least expensive. So 1% cut there is not the same as 1% cut at Normandale. Uh, so this is, you know, when we do things across the board, and I'm sure it's the same with the University of Minnesota, depending on which campus you're at, that the, uh, the freeze affects those schools differently. Um, and I, I think it was Senator Draheim, you had... Uh, brought up a, a, a bill on uh, books so that we would have more courses that were taught without books. Having it, just one year of college, having one less book would more than offset uh, this 1% reduction or a freeze. I mean, we should be looking at these things more systematically, I think, than, um, than the unfortunate way of having to do this, bring a bill forward and uh, you know, try to debate in a very short period of time something as big and as important as this. So thank you. Senator Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, there's been a lot of talk about the numbers, and I think Senator Cohn addressed it, but I just want to make sure that the record reflects and that the, the committee knows what, what we have done over the last uh, six years for higher education. So the 2012-2013 biennium uh, spending for higher education in that biannual budget was about $2.56 billion. Uh, the current biennium is roughly $3.25 billion or an increase of $690 million or 26%. So I do think it's unfair or inaccurate, uh, simply false to say that there have been cuts uh, to higher education uh, over the last uh, six or eight year period. Now you can argue whether or not the increases have been enough. Uh, we could argue all day long that we should do more for higher education. I agree uh, that we should do more for higher education, but to say that there have been cuts in the state budget is inaccurate. Thank you, uh, Senator Miller. Uh, Senator Isaacson, to that point. Thank you. Uh, well, I think that sounds really nice. The reality of what I'm saying is that our lack of funding has caused cuts at the university level. And while it's fun to talk about a $600 million increase, the question is what's the cost of doing business for a university and does that match the $600 million increase? That's the question, right? And so it's easy to say in raw numbers, yeah, we've definitely increased it, but have we increased it by what it costs to do business at the university? No, we haven't, and that's why there's cuts. Thank you. Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, uh, uh, I think uh, everyone has been patient. Uh, I, I think if it's appropriate, uh, Mr. Chair, I'd like to table this for today and have another hearing or have another uh, opportunity to discuss this. I know Senator Isaacson has some, uh, some amendments. I want to be respectful of that and have an opportunity to, to have a good discussion about that. We have some members that want to leave. I just want to you know, just mention 30 years ago, uh, higher education was 14% of our general fund budget. And we've got, we've got a lot of challenges around here. We all are for public education. We are all, all for trying to figure out the health and human services costs. But that has sucked all the oxygen out of the room. We're talking about back then it was 53% of the budget, I think, between those two, uh, uh, E12 and or P K12 through uh, health and human services. And then you, you, you now we're, at, we're closing in on 74, 75% of the budget. So um, we value, I want to reiterate, we value our uh, higher education institutions. And this, this discussion is in no way uh, trying to disrespect the work that they're doing. They're doing tremendous work. But again, we need to continue this discussion and we need to figure out this is a systematic uh, problem of that 3.7% inflation in higher education. We have to figure this out. Somewhere around the country has to figure this out. And I know we've got thoughtful members of this committee and I look forward to continuing this discussion uh, 
in the next few days, next couple weeks. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. So with that, we'll lay this on the table. Uh, we are adjourned.